know, what I want to know is, is how, how does one get involved in doing rock work as a woman? Do you really, really want to know? Or do you just want the rehearsed response that I always give? What would happen if we chose to really tell the truth about ourselves? Like if we really, really just told the real truth of our lives. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that it's my truth. You're listening to him. What I found interesting about this whole wrestling situation with this man was that I was able to face this stranger and basically take him down, but I couldn't stand up to this red devil. There was this female stranger who had entered my life, who I allowed to enter my life, that I was so afraid of. So after this little experience out in Sapphire Valley, I really started plotting, okay, I have got to get her out of the restaurant. I have got to send her packing back to Nashville, Tennessee, where she belongs. This is not her place. And so... I had a few jobs lined up. You know, people were continuing to call me about outdoor work, but I was also still sort of working in the cafe, and I was really tiptoeing around this time bomb of a person. And there was this one Sunday, and I was in the service kitchen. Uh, We were doing brunch, and this customer came up to the service window And she was blonde, uh, real attractive, probably in her late 40s, maybe, mid-40s. And when I looked at her, there was a familiar sense about her, almost like she could have been like a relative of mine. We sort of looked alike. And uh, she, she yells through the service window, that was a great French toast, I think I had like stuffed raspberry cream French toast or something like that, that that brunch as a special. And I said, oh, thank you. And she was real funny and real complimentary and very nice. And, you know, I I had become so kind of like uh, isolated from people. I was really not wanting to to talk to anybody and she sort of just made her way and chit chatted for a little bit. She said, we'll be back. And so about a week or so, uh, she comes in with another woman and, you know, I'm starting to think, is this woman gay? Like she doesn't really look gay. There we go with all of our bias. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about? So But she was with this other woman that kind of did. And I thought, okay, are they like together? And and so she just kept befriending me. And the next thing you know, it was like a weeknight. And she brought in all these gay women. And she said it was a group that met down in, I don't know, the gorge somewhere. And I was like, oh. And so in the cafe, they were all drinking wine, and, and it seemed like they were enjoying themselves, and Ruth was waiting on them, of course, and she was going to make some big tips. With all of this, I was just sort of observing, like, who is this person? And she's like a great PR person, and she was very funny. There were a couple of 
of uh, conservative type people in the restaurant that night. And I noticed a couple of men kind of looking out of the side of their eyes at the situation because these women were just like having a great time. They weren't being all closeted. So a couple of friends of mine that owned a gallery down the street in Black Mountain They had sort of mentioned that they'd been hearing a few rumors. And then I went to get a massage from this woman. And I got on the massage table and she said, well, have you heard the latest gossip? And I said, no. And she said, well, it's about your cafe. And I went, oh, my God. And I said, what? She says, well, I had this client that came in and got on the massage table, and she's from Montreat. She's real conservative, and she said that a friend of hers was in your place the other night, and there was all these, a bunch of gay people in there, and that it was turning into a gay bar. And I said, what? She said, yeah, the the rumor's getting out that it's it's a women's gay bar. <laughs> I just laughed my head off. And I said, oh, my God. I said, well, I guess any kind of publicity is better than none. And, you know, it was like because a group of gay women came in and drank some wine, now it's a gay bar. Small town and, and all of that. But I just, all of a sudden... It was like I started having all these these images in my mind. And, and it was like this tapestry of my life. All these strings in the tapestry were starting to overlap. And I started having these flashes of the, the polar bear rug. And the rug that I laid on after my dad beat the crap out of me and I counted the braids on the rug, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and how I beat the polar bear rug, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, after I wrestled this guy, after having my face down in a rug, the night that Allison hit me in the back of the head with my motorcycle helmet because her girlfriend Lisa was laying beside me in the nude, my face down in this playhouse as a kid with these kids playing bank robber and attempting to sodomize me with a blue dustpan, I was having all these weird flashes starting to go through my mind. My dad standing at the sliding glass door looking into my eyes before he unlocked the door. The man, the wrestling man, looking through his sliding glass door before he unlocked the door. All of these patterns had started to circulate. And I was starting to see like I am living in this repetitive motion it's a spiral and it's going around and around and these it's different faces it's different circumstances but it's the same dynamic over and over and over having no money having money having no money having money starting over new girlfriend, a new face, a new encounter, you know, hitting that wall, it's over, meeting a new person, oh, the sparks and the energy and the love, and it goes on and on and on and on. And all I could think about was tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. I had to get rid of Red Devil. So I got my friend Tina and I said, we're going to go to the police. If I can wrestle a motherfucker from Miami for money, then I can go And take back my property. So Tina and I go to the Black Mountain Police. 
where I knew the police chief, his name was Johnny, he was an older man, really sweet, and I had given the police uh, the policeman a bunch of chocolate. Like, we would take boxes of our chocolate up to the police station when we first opened the chocolate garden, and, you know, we were just trying to get the word out, and we gave chocolate to the firemen and to different service people just to kind of say, hey, we're here, and I think we gave them homemade fudge from what I remember. We go in, I set up a meeting with this Johnny, and we go in his office, and he was wearing like a white long sleeve shirt with his badge and his uniform. And he was a very kind man. He wore glasses, kind of had like a red face, kind of a big gut, kind of looked like he had high blood pressure. But, but he was gentle, and I, I trusted him. So we sat down, and I said, Johnny, I'm going to tell you from the beginning. And I told him every single thing of how I had met Red Devil over the internet and how this entire thing had had come to be. I laid it out there and I was honest. And I told him all about the day that Ann from the Revenue Department came in and how she told me to put it in her name and and that, you know, I was just trying to save myself from this disaster. And he listened. He listened to everything. After we told all this story, he sits back in his chair and he got kind of quiet. And he said, Jill, I hate to tell you this. He said, but if you trespass and you go in there and you start taking out anything from that building, I'm going to have to arrest you. And I went, what? He said, if it's in her name, like you said it is, that means the lease, the bank account, everything, it's legally hers. And I sat there and Tina and I were just silent. And I felt powerlessness like I had felt before, but in a really different way. It was a different kind of defeat than when I hit bottom with alcohol. It was a totally different kind of defeat because I was sober or I was dry. I won't even say sober. Of course, I continued praying and begging God on a daily basis. And I continued with all of the journaling and, and affirmations and Pollyanna positivity. Let me, you know, let me continue to seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God on a daily basis. Let me turn my will and my life over to God as I understand God. See, I never stopped. I love you. I trust you. I need you desperately in my life. I never stopped doing any of that. I continued every day of my existence to turn my day over to something greater than me. Well, now it was becoming comical. You know, maybe there just ain't no God. Maybe there isn't a guiding force in this universe. Maybe it's just all boiling down to brain chemistry. It, could that be real? Maybe there's no best is yet to come. You know, I would think of the old AA days. If no one's told you that they love you today, well, I'm going to tell you right now that I love each and every one of you. And don't give up. Don't give up five minutes before the miracle happens because the best is yet to come. And so all these things 
were just going over and over and over and over in my mind. And Tina and I left the police station. And I called my friend Kristen, who was the daughter of Ann, a woman who had worked with me in Atlanta. And now Kristen had moved to Asheville with her husband and four children. Kristen was uh, 10 years younger than me. She was about six feet tall, super strong, strong woman, funny. I loved her. She was starting to become a good friend. We were getting to know each other better. And I told her everything that had happened. She said, you know what? I will come with you. I will come with you and we'll get your stuff. We're going to get your stuff out of that place, Jill. And Tina had to go back. She couldn't stay very long. And so I was scared. And I said, well, we're going to have to time it, you know, when Red Devil's cooking in the kitchen. And so one day I opened this Mountain Express newspaper. And when I opened it, I was looking at rentals because I thought, maybe I'll just leave. Maybe I'll just move. I don't know what to do. And I opened up the Mountain Express. And right in the center of the page, my eyes went directly to this little ad, Cabin in the Woods, $400, with a phone number. There was another overlap. There I was looking in the Atlanta paper for a job. Need cash fast? Come to this address. Must require a driver's license. Once again, I'm looking in the center of a newspaper. My head is going into the looking glass. I go to a pay phone and I call this number. And they said, sure, you can come out and look at it. It's in Madison County. It's in Marshall. I said, okay. So I drove out to this place and I get out there and it's this young couple and they're like in their 30s and they have like llamas and horses and they own this house where they had this little cottage And it was 400 square feet. And it was basically like a little shoebox. And I walked in it and I had my little dogs and they said that pets were welcome. God bless or whoever bless Lulu and Little. Jesus in heaven. Those two little dogs, they were still hanging in there with me. And I walk into this little cottage, and it's just this kind of cinder blockish wooden siding type of thing. And it had, they'd painted it with new Berber carpet. It was one room, it was one rectangle, and it had one little tiny kitchen with a little tiny stove and a little tiny refrigerator and a little tiny bathroom with a stall shower. I walked around, I looked at it, and I said, I'll take it. I mean, it just came out of my mouth. And so they were like, oh, okay. And so I gave them $400. And then I called my friend Kristen, and I'm like, we're going to have to go down there and get my stuff, what we can get into my truck. And so it was around dinner hour. And we pulled out in front and we unlocked and went upstairs to the apartment. And I was able to get a few of my things, a leather chair, an opium chest that I'd had, just a few things that I really did not want to leave behind. Here I was again in overlap. Greg coming to Tampa to help me flee the scene leaving cranberry, leaving my belongings. So we gather what we can. We carry this massive TV. I don't know why I fucking got that TV, but we get all this stuff and we get it in the back of my truck and we're just hurrying and we're just sweating bullets. And But you know what? Kristen had my back. 
and she was a real friend to me. I didn't allow that many people in my life at this point. I, I had a really hard time accepting help from people because I had always been so self-reliant. But psychologically, I really felt scared that I was about to break. I didn't know how much more that my nervous system was going to be able to handle. And so we got these things into the truck and I couldn't get one more thing. And I drove away from there. And it was this sort of relief, but it was also this huge fear. And I had a storage unit. And so I went ahead and I called up the people. Can I go ahead and bring some things to this cottage? They're like, fine, yes, whatever. So I got things out there and then I went straight to this mattress store because Tina had told me about her grandmother having a tempur mattress and my back was in constant pain. And that's a whole nother kettle of fish. We won't even go into back trauma. But I go in and I just lay on this tempur and I thought, now why didn't I know about this? So I just paid cash and I said, can you deliver this? And they were like, yeah, sure. So I planned a delivery for this tempur mattress to come out to this little cottage and it was a double. It was not a queen because I swore off relationships. No more. That's it. I'm done. I'm going to live out in these woods and I am going to be by myself for the rest of my life. I do not care if I ever, ever see another female, male, in between. I don't care. I'm done. And so I get out there and that Saturday they bring this tempur Well, one person that I had stayed in contact during all this was the man who had had the near-death experience with the sea turtle. And he and I were friends, and I loved him. And he had invited me to his house that afternoon around 5 o'clock. It was on a Saturday. And this was going to be my first day out at this place because I needed this bed. Well, they bring the tempur bed at 10 o'clock in the morning, and they delivered it, and they set it up. I put the sheets on it. I got it all made up. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to lay down on this and just see how how it feels. And I laid down on that that Tempur-Pedic. My dogs jumped up there and there we were. And I kind of laid there. And the next thing I know is I hear this ghetto phone, I call it. I'd gotten one of those phones that you can't really trace And that phone, I'd given that number to this one guy and a few people, but the phone rang and it was him. And he said, well, I was wondering where you were. And I go, what time is it? It was 530 in the afternoon. I had gone into a deep, deep sleep. I think that I was so exhausted from this entire thing that I just completely went into another dimension or something. I felt drugged and I told him, I don't, I'm not going to make it. I said, I'm, I'm just, I'm in this place and we'll catch up later. And I hung up and I was real confused. I felt really out of it. I think I just had had so much that I couldn't I couldn't handle much more. So there I was and I'd given this woman that I'd met in the restaurant, this blonde woman that we both looked like we we're from the same gene pool. I'd given her my number and she had quite a history from what I knew so far. She had been a nun She'd been a PE teacher. She'd been married to a man. Then she came out of the closet. Now she was with women. It was a big story. And she liked vodka. And she was very intriguing to me. You know, sometimes I trust alcoholics more than I do regular people. I'm not saying she was an alcoholic. 
but I, I knew that she loved vodka probably as much as I did. And there was something comforting about that. It was almost like I could drink vicariously through her. Well, there I was, and I'm out there with this in this cottage, and I'm just kind of letting it sink in. And I think, how in the hell am I going to recover? What's going to happen to me? And I remember about a week went by and the new landlords kind of approached me and they said, hey, do you know how to build a deck? And of course, I'm like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, I had built a deck on Bernie Street. And I said, sure. And they said, well, you know, we've got the materials. And if you want to build a little deck on the front of the cottage, you know, we'll knock off a month's rent. And I was just like, okay. And so there was like, okay, there's a month. And it was just sort of this piecing together one day at a time on how I'm going to survive out there and and not have anything and not, and just be, because I really, I felt like I'd just run away. I really felt like I was in hiding because I couldn't take one more letter, one more lawsuit, one more thing. Now, I did stay in touch with my friend Carlos in Atlanta that had made all the statuary pieces for this Atlanta fountain. And I had actually made a couple of trips down to see him and to pay him some money because I swore to him, I will pay you every penny of this because Carlos had put his stuck his neck out for me and I was really going to, to do my best to pay him back. So a week or so had gone by and it was a Saturday morning and I was sitting in my leather chair and I was just staring. I was paralyzed. And I sat there and I kept thinking, I'm like my dad. I'm like my dad sitting in that recliner after he left Kodak. You know, he retired at 55 and he didn't have a life. He didn't have anything. He had been drinking and smoking and womanizing and was just sort of done. And so he just kind of resigned himself to sit in that chair and watch University of fucking Georgia football go dogs. And I felt like I was fucking concreted into the chair. I looked over at my oven and I had this fucking pan on top of the stove with a frozen pizza. And I was so grossed out at myself and my life and my diet and my choices and everything about myself I detested. And I kept sitting there and I thought, all this missing's a drink. All that's missing in this scenario is a bottle. A bottle of wild turkey or a bottle of tequila or a bottle of vodka. Who cares? Just bring it. I knew I couldn't. I knew I couldn't drink. There's some little thing. I don't know what it is. There's some little thing down in there that knows that that would only perpetuate this to be even worse than it is. I wouldn't have the luck to choke and die like my friend Laura down the street. I would linger. I would linger. I would be one of those people that would be walking in and out of restaurants and taking food off of people's plates I know in my core that I would just linger on and just destroy other lives. And during all this time, nobody in my family knew what was going on with me. My family, they lay low in times of trouble. You know, if you're looking good and you got a good vehicle and it's clean and you're thin, and you're wearing good clothes, and your hair's cut good, and, you know, you look 
fresh and healthy, then then they will come around. They want to be around you. But if you got something going on and you're a little bit down and you might be a little depressed or you're not looking like you should, then boy, they steer clear. And you know what? I don't blame them. All they had in their recollection of me from high school on was drama. You know, this larger-than-life personality from high school who was an introvert. I didn't. I never chose to be a larger-than-life personality. I was painfully shy. It wasn't until I picked up the bottle that I decided that I could open my mouth and speak. Nobody knew me. Nobody knew this darkness. Nobody knew how destroyed my life was. And I couldn't tell anybody because it would just be more guilt and more shame. And I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and I looked out that door. And my two little dogs were running in and out. And I had the sliding glass door sort of open so they could come in and out as they wished. And they loved it. <laughs> they were in heaven in this new environment because they'd been living upstairs in that fucking apartment with that legless Pomeranian and they were like, whoa, get us out. So they were having fun and that was that was one high point of that experience was seeing them running in and out that door. Well, I looked out into the front yard and there was this cherry tree and I looked past the cherry tree and there's a little old mailbox and then the dirt road. And this little voice or something inside of me said, go to the mailbox. If you can just get up and walk to the mailbox and then come right back. Now, we're talking maybe 40 feet, 50 feet away. And the little voice said, only go to the mailbox. Do not walk past the mailbox and then come back. And then it said, tomorrow you'll walk 10 steps past the mailbox and then come back. And then the next day you will walk 10 steps past that mark and then you'll come back. And so I got up and I walked out to the mailbox And I looked in the mailbox and I didn't have anything. And I walked back in and I sat back down. And the next day, I did the same thing. And I walked 10 steps past the mailbox. And I turned around and I came back. Because this little voice said, do not be an overachiever. And do not be an underachiever. You have to walk 10 steps and turn around and come back. 10 steps per day. Do not walk over the 10 steps. And so each day I started this little process. No matter what, I would walk the 10 extra steps and I would take some sort of rock or stick or something. I'd make a marker. And I would know where I had gone the next day. And so this little game or this little process was something that I kind of had on my routine. Because I didn't have much else going on. I was building a deck. And I didn't have much work at all. Then the lady from the restaurant, Jean Poole, will call her, my twin. She calls me and says, hey, I got this friend named Fat Julie. I'm like, Fat Julie? And I'm like, that's mean. And she says, well, I mean, that's what everybody calls her. And I'm like, oh, my God. Who's everybody? She goes, well, me. She lived with Skinny Julie. 
So that was the way that she, you know, described the Julie's. And she said, yeah, Fat Julie, she moved up here. and She's got four chairs she needs to have refinished. And uh, I told her maybe you could do it. And so this, this like gene pool blonde vodka drinking ex-nun was starting to hook me up with these little weird money-making opportunities. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I'm just going to say yes, because what else am I going to do? So I go into Asheville with my truck, and I go to Fat Julie's apartment. She opens the door, and I knew the minute that she opened the door, she looked me up and down like I was some sort of pork chop, and she was the coyote. But I come in, and she shows me the chairs, and she says, uh, yeah, really, I need somebody to redo these, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, fine, I'll take them, because I'd had my dabblings in furniture. So I get them all loaded up in my truck, and she tucks four $100 bills in my back pocket of my butt. And I'm like, oh, God. And she goes, here, you might need this. I'll go ahead and pay you up front. I figured $100 a chair would be fair. And I'm like, okay, well, thank you so much, and la, la, la. So I take them back to the the cabin, and I work on the chairs. So it was just interesting how, how money and how situations kind of turned up. Because nobody had my phone number. I mean, I basically disappeared. And how was I going to get work? How was I going to keep functioning? At this point, I really didn't care. And so this one day, I went by my storage unit and I decided to sell everything that I had left from my landscape world and anything that I had. I'm, I got to sell it. So I had a big sale. I sold a bunch of stuff. Had a big commercial mower that I'd paid $10,000 for. I mean, I, I had a lot of stuff. And so I made a little bit of money on all that. And then I took all the boxes and files and shit. And I just started trashing it and burning it. I'm just going to burn this shit up. Who cares? Who cares? At this point, the only thing that would have kept me from, like, wanting to go to prison was my dogs. Like, prison might have been a welcome because I wouldn't have had to worry about making it and surviving. Well, I continued this walking thing. No matter what, no matter what. I'd get on that road no matter what. If it was pouring down rain, I would wrap myself up in garbage bags and I would go. I wore a hat and I would go. And I'd take Lulu and Little on their leashes. Well, some time had gone by. I started walking and it was snowing. It was a blizzard. It wasn't just snowing because this cabin was really over toward the Tennessee line. And they, they have a lot of weather coming that way. Higher elevation and a lot more snow than downtown Asheville or Black Mountain. And so by now, I had increased my walk to where I was out on the main road. And I was getting to know certain houses and dogs. There was this one house that had two Shih Tzus that would always come to their glass door and bark. And the lady one day waved. It took her a while to warm up to me. And and I think the dogs was sort of a bond. And her dog's names were Todd and Ted, the Shih Tzus. And that made me laugh. And then there was another dog and her name was Sadie. And she was an Australian Shepherd. But she was not on a leash. And one day I was walking back and I had turned down the dirt road to my house and I heard a woman screaming and Sadie had gotten hit by a car because the woman 
lived right on the road and didn't have her on a leash or anything. And poor Sadie would go after the tires. I'd seen her day after day just going after cars. And I tied my two dogs to a tree and I ran as fast as I could. And she was hovered over Sadie in the road, screaming and crying. And so I helped her and I just picked Sadie up and carried her. And the woman was so distraught. And I took her down and laid her in her garage. And it was just horrible. And I told the lady, I'm just so, so sorry. And she was just, she was just going crazy. And I I, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't help her. I didn't know her. And I just put my hand on her wrist. And I said, just, I live down that road. If you need anything, just come get me. Just, uh, I'm so sorry. And I walked on and I got the dogs. But, you know, I couldn't even cry. I was I was in this spot. I was in this place where I really couldn't cry anymore. I think I'd cried so much that it was just, I was either just so walled up or I'm not sure. With this particular day of the snow, I keep walking and I'm going and I'm going. And it was, you know how quiet it is when it snows it's almost deafening it's so quiet and the blizzard you could hear the wind kind of blow and the snow was just blowing and I had put on big coats and a hat and I put a big black garbage bag over my coat and cut the sleeves out and I put some Ingalls grocery store bags around my dog's and made them little jackets and then tied some little shirts, t-shirts with a belt. I mean, this is ridiculous. As much money as I've made in my life, and I can't even afford a fucking dog sweater, but that's where I was. So I made them something, and I thought, y'all going with me. I feel real bad about that looking back, because their poor little paws are probably frozen. I should have made them a pair of boots, but they, they seemed pretty excited. So we're going up this road, and everything is covered in snow. And no matter what, see, I have to go. It doesn't matter, because I have this little voice that says, I have to do this. And so I get up to this certain point, and I start hearing this like, And I'm like, what is that sound? And I look over, my eyes are kind of squinting because of the snow's just blasting. And there's this massive pine tree, just massive. And it wasn't a white pine. It was like an old, either black pine or loblolly, but this thing was old and massive. And I kid you not, this pine tree. It was so weighted down with the snow, all the limbs and all the foliage, and it was just drooping, and I saw in this tree like an old, old man's face, not even like a man's face, kind of like a father time face. In this entire tree, it was like this entity. And I stared at it, and I kept listening to it. It was like it was crying out to me. It was like it was in pain, and its eyes were closed. And it was swaying. You know how pine trees sort of sway, and it had the snow waiting it. And every time that it would sway, it would creak with the sound. And as I stood there, All of a sudden, I had this little voice, and it said to me, See, that tree can't leave. That tree can't go and get a drink, or go to the mall and shop, or run away. That tree has to stand there. It has to take whatever comes at it. If a hunter comes by and and 
you know, knocks a hatchet in the side of that tree, the tree has to take it. If somebody takes a chainsaw to it, the tree has to, to stand there. If weather or lightning strikes, the tree has to stand grounded. That tree is grounded into the earth, rooted into something. And all of a sudden, I realized that tree and I are just alike. Except I have been choosing every form and fashion of a band-aid that I can find to attach to this pain and to tape over and mask over and pour pink paint over every time I get a bad feeling. In that moment, In that moment, something happened to me. And I made an agreement with the tree and the universe or whatever it was that was speaking inside of my brain that this is it. I'm not moving. I'm not going to do anything except walk this road. I'm not going to move until you move me. I don't know what's best for me. I know that helping others and service is where it's at. But even in my futile attempts to do that, it just doesn't feel authentic. It feels selfish. So many people had given to me along the way that I felt obligated to give. Am I giving for that other human or am I just giving to try to give to myself? Am I just so self-absorbed and so selfish that I cannot see past? Can't see the forest for the trees. Well, I saw this tree and this wasn't just a tree. This was a tree. I turned around and I had the two dogs on the leash and I started singing this song and it was a little song that I made up for these little dogs and I said, here we go down the road right now, here we go down the road right now, she's a good girl, he's a bad boy, she's a good boy, she's a good girl, he's a bad boy and I went on and on and on and I sang this stupid little song all the way back to that cabin. Here we go down the road right now. Here we go down the road right now. She's a good girl. He's a bad boy. She's a good boy. She's a good girl. Here we go down the road right now. Here we go down the road right now. She's a good girl. He's a bad boy. She's a good boy. She's a good girl. Here we go. Hammered is recorded and produced in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's narrated by Jill Haney, produced by Maggie Briggs and Jill Haney, and with sound design, editing, and music by Alexander Rodriguez. Our beautiful artwork was created by Lauren Caddick, and we'd like to send a special thanks out there to Minnie and Robin. You can check out our website, podcasthammer.com, and follow us on social media for updates.